Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, worship team, this morning. And let's look, everyone, to the Word of God in 2 Samuel chapter 23 in the Old Testament, please. We'll be reading some New Testament verses as well, but we begin today with an Old Testament story that will be the focus of our attention today. A man by the name of Eleazar. Everybody say that. Eleazar. Eleazar. He will be our focus today, not for a history lesson, but to use him as an example today of some spiritual truths that will be uh, brought to us by our New Testament uh, scriptures as well today. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse number 8. These are the names of David's mighty men. Josheb Bashabeth, a Tachamanite, was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. Next to him was Eleazar, son of Dodai the Ahohite. As one of the three mighty men, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at Pasdamim for battle. Then the men of Israel retreated, but Eleazar stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eleazar, but only to strip the dead. Then we look to Revelation chapter 17. We're reading this Old Testament story about a man who served in the service of King David. And as we prepare to use that story as an illustration this morning of some spiritual truths, I want to think about our king and our kingdom living and our call to fight for the benefits of the kingdom. How many of you have ever had to fight for a benefit that belonged to you? (laughs) Maybe make a few extra phone calls, huh? Maybe stand your ground a little bit longer, huh? Sometimes we have to fight for what belongs to us as children of the kingdom. And so, reading that Old Testament story now about Eleazar, we move to Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. Jesus, the Lamb, is Lord of lords and King of kings, and with Him will be His called, chosen, and faithful followers. In other words, we're following King Jesus. Would you say amen? And then a verse from Romans chapter 14, verse 17, about kingdom commodities that belong to us as citizens of the kingdom. Romans 14, 17 says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Everybody say righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Then we come to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, and this charge. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. 2 Samuel chapter 23 lists the names of David's mighty men. Heroes in the service of their king, King David. David himself was a powerful warrior from the days of his youth, killing lions and and bears single-handedly as a teenage shepherd, slaying the giant Goliath with a slingshot. Killing a hundred men in one encounter. David was a natural warrior. But David gave all of the credit for his many mighty acts to the Lord. Remember when David marched out against the giant Goliath? He declared to the giant Goliath, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. David was a warrior, but he depended on the Lord's strength. And David surrounded himself with men of like spirit, warriors who were marked and set apart for their boldness and bravery, fighters who were filled with faith and were ferocious in their warfare. They were empowered and helped and used by God. 
The mightiest of those warriors in service to King David were initiated into an elite military group known to Bible historians as David's Mighty Men. David's Mighty Men. Their names are recorded in both 2 Samuel 23 and 1 Chronicles chapter 11. Notice this is a group that contains some structure, David's mighty men. There were the three, the three. There were the 30. There was the chief of the three. And there was the commander of the three. All together, the 30 and the three numbered 37. <laughs> now, the math is a little complicated. I have a system worked out for that math and the names and how that math works out, but that's beyond our purposes this morning. But the, the, the mighty men who served under King David were men who had risen among the ranks and risen to special status as especially bold, brave, faith-filled men. Today, we consider the second in the list of David's mighty men, a man named Eleazar. There's his name before us. He was a member of the three. Now, was he a member of the 30? Well, he was a member of the three, and he participated with the 30. We'll say that as we, as we, we, we work through the math and the structure that is a little bit unclear to us. He was one of the three mighty men who were at the top of the ranks. In David's forces. No doubt Eleazar participated in many great campaigns for the kingdom and was instrumental in many of David's victories. But today we have recorded for us his signature battle. We might call this his moment of fame here in 2 Samuel chapter 23. Listen to the story in just a couple verses again in verse number 9. Next to him was Eleazar son of Dodi the Ahohite, as one of the three mighty men. He was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at Pasdamon for battle. Notice now what caused this man Eleazar to stand out. Then the men of Israel retreated before the Philistines, but Eleazar stood his ground. When everybody else fled, he remained in place. He stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. <laughs> the Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eleazar, but only to strip the dead. In other words, when the troops returned, Eleazar had already killed everybody. <laughs> How many of you know that's a fine time to return? When the work's all ready. How many of you know, you know what that's like when somebody else is doing the dirty work and suddenly you wake for, up from the nap just in time to return when the work is done. The troops returned to Eleazar, but he had already brought about that great victory that day and all they had to do was strip the dead. Now, this is a great story from the pages of biblical history. If we were to move down further in the chapter, we would read about a man who went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. These are, are great acts of heroism. And the story before us today is a great story from Bible history, but our purpose today is not just to learn a history lesson, but to learn a spiritual lesson. Romans 15, verse 4, a verse I call upon regularly in preaching the Word of God. Romans 15, 4 says, all of those Old Testament stories were written to encourage us in New Testament living. So, how many of you understand, we don't throw out the Old Testament, we use it in New Testament light and with the help of the Holy Spirit. And so our purpose today is to draw from the story of Eleazar a spiritual picture for us today. In general, it's a picture of devotion to the king and a picture of kingdom living and, and fighting and struggling in order to embrace 
the kingdom living that is available to us as children of the one true king whose name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you say amen? So this morning we're going to look together at Eleazar's master, Eleazar's mission, and Eleazar's ministry might. His master, his mission, he's a warrior now. His master, his mission, his military might. We begin this morning about thinking about Eleazar's master. Because, because though this man was a hero, he was not the leader. Now, he was leader quality because he, he, he was a man of exceptional boldness and faith. He was a man of leader quality, but he was not the leader. He had a master, and that master was King David. Notice the scripture calls him one of David's mighty men. And so Eleazar it lived to, to serve his master, the king. He was all about the king. He was all about the king's business. In fact, Eleazar was part of David's force even before David became king over Israel. Eleazar was a follower of David from the early Days. What do we know about Eleazar and his relationship to King David? Well, we know, first of all, that he was loyal to his king. He's called one of David's mighty men. He's listed among those who followed David. And we know from the historical records that he stuck with David down through the years of time so that ultimately his name would be recorded in Scripture. He was loyal to his king. The second thing we know about Eliezer is that he loved his king. This was not just a master-servant relationship. This was a king who was loved by his people. And Eliezer loved David. We see that in one of my favorite little stories in the Old Testament. Here, if we move down in 2 Samuel 23, we read this story in verse 13. Now, notice this story. This, this, this not only will paint a spiritual picture for us, but it might paint a practical uh, picture that we'll talk about in a moment as well for us. Scripture says, during the harvest time, three of the 30 chief men came down to David at the cave of Adullam. While a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. At that time, David was in the stronghold. This is before David was king, while David was still running from King Saul. David was in the stronghold, and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and said, Oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. Now, somebody tell me what... Where was David's hometown? It's Bethlehem. Okay. What does David long? David is longing for a drink of water from his hometown. Now, how many of you are, are, uh, are longtime Jefferson Cityans? Let me see your hand. Most of you Jefferson Cityans, you would never have any particular longing for a drink of Jefferson City water. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay. But David had become fond of the water in the well at his hometown. And perhaps, I, and I, this was not a matter of thirst, this was a matter of longing for something familiar and something sentimental to him. And David longed for water from the well at Bethlehem. So what did the three mighty men do? The three mighty men broke through the Philistine lines drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem and carried it back to David. Imagine that. <laughs> what, why did they do this? They, they, not because David was dying of thirst, but because David was longing for that. And, and the three mighty men said, we want to do something to please our king. And so at the risk of their own lives, they broke through the enemy lines, went down, sneaked down, got some water from the well at Bethlehem, maneuvered their way back, and presented it as an offering of devotion and love to their king. What, a, what an awesome picture. Almost as if somebody in the house said, you know, Pastor Lowell, he loves that ice cream down at Cold Stone Creamery. I believe I'm going to just, I believe, 
I'm just going to run down to Cold Stone and pick him up. Just a, just a, a little bowl of vanilla bean, sea salt, mixed with pecans and chocolate shavings. I'm just going to go and present that to him. A few weeks ago, I was gone on that day, but a few weeks ago, Nancy told me, Michael and Ashley Boyce, Ashley arrived at the church one afternoon with her two little girls marching, two little blonde-headed girls. You saw them last Sunday in the baby dedication, marching into the church office. The oldest of the two, sweet little Alice, was carrying in her hand an ice cream treat for Pastor Lowell. (laughs) Nancy said it was the cutest thing on earth. I was gone, but how many of you know I inherited my blessing when I got back? (laughs) Those two little girls. Do you mind, Michael and Ashley, if I rename those two little girls Lowell's Mighty Women? Carrying an ice cream. This picture of David's mighty men, the three mighty men carrying water back to their king. A beautiful picture. The rest of the story just absolutely ticks me off. <laughs> notice notice here, to, here now. But David refused to drink it. Instead, he poured, out, poured it out before the Lord. It said, far be it from... David gets all spiritual here. How many of you know there's a time for spirituality and a time for practicality? (laughs) David gets all spiritual and says, he said, no, I'm not going to drink that. Far be it from me, O Lord, to do this. He said, is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives? And David would not drink it. He He poured it out. Before the Lord, how many of you know, believe with me today that the Lord did not need that drink of water? A strange end to the story. But the motivation in the hearts of those three mighty men was the motivation of love for their king. Do you know as children of God, as we worship our king, sometimes we just lift our hands, sometimes we sing out a song, sometimes a tear streams down from our face. Sometimes we just tell the Lord, oh, Lord Jesus, I love you. I thank you for being my faithful king and my faithful Lord. David's mighty men loved him. They were loyal to him. They loved him as their king. And ultimately, Eleazar lived his life for his king. Second Samuel 23, 17 simply says, such were the exploits of the three mighty men. He, he lived his life to please his king. Now there are spiritual pictures all over this. I'm not, I don't know that this, that this story of Eleazar was written specifically with the intent to serve as an example of our devotion to Jesus. But it certainly is a beautiful example of our relationship to our king. The Lord Jesus. How many of you are loyal to Jesus? Say amen. How many of you love Jesus? Say amen. And how many of you are intended to live your life for Jesus? Say amen. Well, our King and Master is Jesus, who has redeemed us from darkness and brought us into his kingdom of light. To him and to his kingdom cause, we pledge our loyalty, our love, our lives, and our day-to-day living. And as we follow Jesus, is everybody with me today? As we follow Jesus and his kingdom, our lives turn in a dramatically different direction. Our lives change dramatically. Now remember our scripture where this this message is may may turn in a direction in which you did not expect today, but I want us to think about A verse of scripture from the New Testament we read a moment ago from Romans chapter 14, where the Bible declares that the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but it is, the kingdom of God is, get this, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Everybody say, righteousness, peace, joy 
in the Holy Spirit. These are kingdom commodities, all right? Now, we're going to think about those commodities as we think about the second main point in this message, and that is an examination of Eleazar's mission, okay? Eleazar's master was King David. What was Eleazar's mission as a man in the army, as one of the, 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 of the three mighty men? Well, his mission, first of all, was to expel enemies from the kingdom. Verse 9 in our story today says, Eleazar was there, and as one of the three mighty men, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered for battle. Eleazar was with David as they taunted the enemy. You're not getting in here. You're not getting past us. You bunch of no goods. You think you're all that? Come on, try it out. I, I don't know what that taunting looked like, but I love the idea of it. Come on, devil, make my day. One of those kind of things. They taunted the enemy. Well, Eleazar's mission on behalf of King David was to expel the enemies from the kingdom so the kingdom could could thrive and flourish and grow. In fact, that's the second part of his mission, not only to to expel the enemies, but the mission included establishing and expanding the kingdom as well. Verse number 10, 1 Chronicles 11, 10 says, these were the chiefs of David's mighty men. They, together with all Israel, get this, gave his kingship strong support to extend it over the whole land as the Lord had promised. So this is the list of David's mighty men. They're giving David support to expand the kingdom, to extend the kingdom over the whole land. So they're, get it now, they're driving out enemies in order to build up the kingdom in, in the presence and the power of God. Well, as we think about that this morning, we understand that our enemies, if we think about what our enemies are, that we need to expel. How many of you know that our enemies are not flesh and blood? Could I have a better amen? They are spiritual enemies, principalities and powers. And in in light of our scriptures today about what the kingdom of God is like, and the commodities that are to, to prevail in the kingdom of God, if the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy, then our enemies, the enemies to those things would be sin, fear and worry, gloom, doom, and despair, and overwhelming discouragement. Now think about that. If the kingdom is righteousness, what's the enemy to living out the righteousness of God? Sin. If the kingdom is peace... The enemy to that is constant worry and fear, a troubled mind, a chaotic spirit that can't experience the peace of God. If the kingdom of God is joy, look up at me, everybody, look up at me. If, if there's one topic that many Christians need to hear about today and need to experience, it's the fresh joy of the Lord. I'm telling you, we live in a dark, difficult, troubled world, and as Christians, we need to be living above that in the joy of the Lord. And if the kingdom of God is joy in the Holy Spirit, then the enemy to that is overwhelming discouragement. Sadness that takes a hold of us and keeps us from moving forward. Enemies to the kingdom of God and to the operation of kingdom commodities and qualities in our lives. So, let's look at these principles. One, Christ's kingdom is about experiencing and and expanding and extending righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. If that's the kingdom and the kingdom is within you, then how many of you know your life ought to be marked by righteousness, peace, and joy? Could I have an amen? Your life ought to be marked by righteousness, peace, and joy. Some of you here today, your life is not marked by righteousness. 
You, you are a Christian believer. You love the Lord. You want to serve the Lord. But your life has continually been marked by sinful struggles where you give in to temptation again and again. Sinful things have you held and bound. You are addicted to things that, that are displeasing to God. And you struggle with those things over and over and over and over. And your life is not marked by prevailing righteousness in the Lord. And you need victory in that area. Some of you here today, if the kingdom of God is peace, then you haven't lived in kingdom living for a long time because you are absolutely paralyzed by fear and worry. You can't move without being worried about something or struggling with the the confusion in your mind that keeps you from experiencing the peace of God. How many of you know that God wants us to experience a peace that surpasses understanding? Say amen. Amen. Some of you, if the kingdom of God is joy, you might be like somebody who said to me years ago, I haven't had any joy in years. Well, as a child of God, you are called to experience a joy that is indescribable and full of glory, a great joy, a joy in the Lord. Could I have an amen? A joy that gives you a strength and propels you into being a faithful child of God and servant of God and witness for the Lord Jesus. I'll tell you, the best witnesses for Jesus are those who have experienced an overwhelming joy in the Lord and a powerful spirit of thanksgiving for what God has done for them. Yeah. And so as we, as we think about our mission, our mission is about... A, about experiencing righteousness, peace, and joy, and about extending and expanding that around about us. Are you listening? Through encouraging other believers and through sharing the gospel and the good news of Jesus to those out in the world who have no idea what righteousness, peace, and joy look like. Because, listen, those qualities are distinctly Christian. Yeah. In their reality, in their fullness, those qualities are distinctly Christian. It's followers of Jesus in the kingdom who experience righteousness, peace, and joy. So, this is our mission. Our mission, secondly, is both defensive and offensive. We are called to fight the enemy, and we are called to take hold of this spiritual life. So, if you are here today and you can't get any peace in your life, then as a child of God, I encourage you to fight against the enemies of peace in your own life. Fight against it. If, if you are troubled by a constant spirit of fear, then you need to rise up and say, I'm sick and tired of being afraid of, of my own shadow. I'm not going to live like that anymore. I'm going to grab hold of the peace of God and bring it by faith And by the work of the Holy Spirit and through the scriptures into my own life. Do you see that? I'm going to fight against the enemies and I'm going to take hold of the promises of God. The life that God has for me. Now, 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 some of you are listening, you have no intention of doing what I'm talking about, and the reality is you will live on in your old defeated spirit for years to come if you don't come to a decision someday to say, I'm tired of living like a child of the world and a child of the devil, and I'm going to start living like a child of God in the blessings of the kingdom. So that's our mission. And thirdly, our mission is within us and it's around us and is both general and specific. We have to say, what is my spiritual mission? I'm called to experience these kingdom qualities and I'm called to spread these kingdom qualities through my my work and witness for Jesus Christ. Remember now, Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit are transforming qualities. And our mission involves establishing those things in our own lives and preaching the gospel, encouraging others so that the kingdom of God grows. Huh? Is there anybody in the house who could use more peace in your life? How about some more joy in your life? 
Some of you maybe not want to admit it. How many of you could need a, a little more righteous living in your life? Sure, we, we could grow in those areas. That's the kingdom of God growing within us and through our influence. So Eliezer's master was David. Our master is King Jesus. Eleazar's mission, getting rid of the enemies of the kingdom and expanding and extending the kingdom. And thirdly and finally this morning, we think for a moment about Eleazar's military might. After all, this story is about a warrior, a military hero. Let's talk for a moment about his training and his toughness. Verse 8 simply refers to him as one of David's mighty men. That certainly tells us that he was a man who strengthened himself, who trained and became a tough guy. He was mighty in the business of the king. He was mighty in warfare. He was mighty in the things of God. Evidently, David brought him in to his inner circle. I believe he would have been mighty in the things of God. His training and toughness. He is really famous in this story for his tenacity. Verse number 9, the story says, When the men of Israel retreated, all of these Philistines out there, when the men of Israel retreated, Eleazar stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. Uh, Anybody here, you've sat somewhere for so long that when you got up, you could hardly move. You were stuck in that position. If you've never experienced that, just wait a few years and you'll experience that. You get up out of the recliner and you're still reclining. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you end up needing one of those chairs like my dad has where it, 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 the electric power just kind of pushes you out of the recliner. How many of you, you really need an electric button to push you out of the recliner too? Yeah, I do. Well, Eleazar had, had fought with that sword. I'm not, a, I'm not a swordsman, but that's about the best I can do. Fought with that sword. So tenaciously, so severely, so extendedly, as one enemy soldier after another fell before him, that ultimately his hand became frozen to the sword. The the King James Version says his hand clave to the sword. His his tenacity. He said, We're he said, I'm not leaving here till the Till the battle is won and the deal is done. Do you know that our enemy in the spiritual realms is a serious, severe enemy? And some, do you know that the enemy is going to be fighting you your whole life long? Did you know that? How many of you have served the Lord for a long time? The devil still fights against you. You Our enemy fights us. We need a tenacious spirit that says, no, the enemy will not prevail in my life. The enemy will not prevail. I'm going to be strong in the Lord. I'm going to wield the sword. I'm going to fight for my righteousness, my peace, my joy in the Holy Spirit. I'm going to live a victorious Christian life. I'm not going to fall prey to what the enemy wants for my life. I'm going to experience what God has for my life. Listen, my future, my destiny, my standard of living is not up to the devil. It's up to God. And I'm going, to, I'm going to get and live in what God has for me. Oh, that takes a tenacious spirit. Eleazar was trained and tough. He was tenacious. Ultimately, let's consider his trust, which led to his triumph. First, Second Samuel 23, 10 says about that, that battle, the Lord. Everybody say the Lord. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. Who got the credit? The Lord got the credit. You know, we might do some pretty fancy things sometimes, but we better be careful and and understand that without Him, we can do nothing. A lot of people, you know, boast a lot of big boasts about what they're going to do and, you know, all this. And they even accomplish some pretty mighty things. But the truth is, we couldn't breathe our next breath without the strength of the Lord. And Eleazar, though he was a mighty warrior 
and was holding the sword in his own hand. Yet the credit goes to the Lord. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The truth is, Eleazar would have fallen a long time ago, but the Lord helped him to stand in the midst of that, and the Lord strengthened him to win the battle. The Lord brought about a great victory that day, and notice what the triumph looked like. The troops returned to Eleazar, but only to strip the dead. Why? Because Eleazar had already knocked everybody down, and the battle was won. And the rest of the men were able simply to share in the victory that day. Now we close with these three final observations. One, we must discipline ourselves to become strong in the Lord's mighty power. He is the source of our victories. Amen. Two, we must arise in courage to dispel the darkness and advance the kingdom of God within us. And around us. Okay? If you're tired of of the devil making sport of you, then rise up and declare, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I will not be a servant to the devil any longer. Remember, in our study of the book of Romans chapter 8 a couple of weeks ago, we declared that we have been adopted into the family of God. We are no longer slaves to fear. Could I have an amen? We are sons and daughters of God. So let's rise up and take our place in that. We must dispel the darkness and advance the kingdom of God within us and around us. And thirdly and finally, we must persevere and prevail even when countless enemies surround us until the victory is won. Victorious living is marked by embracing and disseminating powerful commodities. How many of you consider yourself, yourselves children of the kingdom of God? Let me see your hand. You are a kingdom kid. If you are a child of the kingdom, then your life is to be marked by righteousness, peace, and joy. A friend, a preacher friend of mine recently reminded me of a story that he had told years ago about his sister, who was a longtime Christian lady. She had served the Lord all, all her life, as, as he had. And he said there came a time in her life, in her mid-40s, he said she had been always an, a, a fairly negative, doubtful person with not much positive to say. He said there came a time in her life, in her mid-40s, where he noticed that she dramatically changed. She'd been a Christian all those years. She dramatically changed and was transformed. If I named these people, you'd know these people. They're not from our, our family of believers, but you'd know these people. She changed dramatically. Suddenly, she became encouraging and loving and positive. And filled with hope, with statements of faith on a regular basis, her life, her Christian life, just like turned upside down on its head. And for the rest of her life, for years to come, she's gone on home to be with the Lord now, for the rest of her life, she lived that new life rather than that old life she had traded in. And my friend said to me, you know, I looked at that, and he said, finally, after a while, he said, after, you know, a few months of that, I thought, well, this is some phase she's going through. She's, total, she's a totally different person. This is some phase. It was his sister. This is some phase she's going through. And so he, he waited a little while longer. She maintained that new victorious spirit. And so he went to her, and he said, sis, what, what's up here? He said, you, you have totally changed your attitude, your approach to people, your, the way you share. He said, you have totally changed. What's, what's happened? She said, well, she said, one day I heard a word in a sermon, in, in a message. 
And I just decided, you know what? I'm tired of being the way I've been all these years. I'm not going to live like that anymore. I'm going to go a new route. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the person that I believe God really wants me to be. And she said, I took hold of that. And she said, I just made up my mind that I'm, I'm going to take hold of the life that the Lord wants for me. And do you know that life? She lived that life. I, I have only known the lady. I have had only known the lady after the transformation took place. I had always known her as a lady of absolute joy and gladness and encouragement and love. She, just a beautiful, spirited woman. I can hardly even imagine her the old way. But she herself acknowledged this took place one day. I determined I'm not living that way anymore. I'm going to live this new life. And that new spirit of victory prevailed in her life from that day until she saw Jesus face to face a few years ago. And my friend of mine, preacher friend, a successful preacher, said to me, I just determined in my own life, if my sister could make a decision even as a Christian believer, and be transformed so radically, then nothing is impossible for God. And any Christian, are you listening this morning? Any Christian can make a decision on any day. I'm going to expel the kingdom enemy, enemies from my spirit. I'm going to grab hold of what God has promised to me, and I'm going to live in the victory of that. From this day forward. Jesus name. I want you to understand friend. You do not have to be bound. By unrighteousness. You can live out the righteousness of God. Huh? You don't have to be bound by fear. Worry. Trepidation. Timidity. You can live in the peace of God. You don't have to be gloom, doom, and despair all the time. Discouraged about everything with no real hope. You can live in the joy of the Lord that will be a source of supernatural strength. Amen. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. These are marks of the kingdom believer. And we want them. Today, in Jesus' name, amen.